Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. We'll get started. Father, we're grateful for today. Grateful for the grace that you've given us in each of our lives in so many different <clears throat> so many different ways. I pray you'll be with us today as we study. We do specifically pray, Lord, for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit of God by which we can understand the deeper things of God. We do understand, Lord, that in our natural selves, we do things that can inhibit everything that you would seek to do in and through us and to us. We know that our salvation is secure, but we can get out of fellowship with you. And so in preparation for the teaching ministry of your spirit, we're going to take a few moments of silence to do personal confession before you so our hearts uh, can be ready to receive eternal truth. We're thankful, Lord, for a new year. We're thankful for the fact that you're a God of new beginnings. I pray you'll be with us uh, both in Sunday school and in the main service that follows. All the classes that are meeting right now, even as I'm speaking, I pray you'll be with all of those classes. I pray your Holy Spirit will be at work in many, many hearts. And for many, we do pray for many salvations, that today could be the day of salvation for many, many people. We just ask that you'll do this great work uh, this morning here at Sugarland Bible Church. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. All right, well, let's open our Bibles to Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2 and verse 4. I'm sure you guys are enjoying the global warming. <laughs> For us in Texas, this is like freezing, right? If you go to Iowa, this is like summertime. Well, we're continuing to move through verse by verse um, through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul the Apostle, having planted the church in Thessalonica up north, the circle at the top there, pushed out of that church by unbelieving Jews who were jealous of his success amongst the Gentiles. So he goes down south. Uh, to Corinth, and it's there that he discovers a problem within six months to a year of when he left Thessalonica. The problem is given in verse 2 of Second Thessalonians. He says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, Disturbed either by spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So they received this forged letter that the tribulation period had started. And this, of course, is a problem for Paul because he had taught them the opposite. He had taught them this, that they were in the church age, living pre-rapture. And the next event for them on the prophetic horizon would be the rapture. So here comes this forged letter that says the exact opposite of what Paul had said. They had missed the rapture and they were in the tribulation period. So they were uh, what we would call shaken to the core of their being. So Paul, partly to correct them, 
and partly to vindicate his own apostolic authority because if he's wrong here, what else could he be wrong on? Explains to them that they are not in the tribulation period because they haven't seen five events. And no one, unless they've seen these five events, can say definitively we're in the tribulation period. So the first thing he says, verse 3, is you haven't seen the departure, which is a synonym for the rapture, as we've tried to argue. The second thing you haven't seen is the Antichrist desecrating the temple. And so we've sort of unpacked all of that and explained what that means. And as you look at the very last part of verse 4, he explains what the Antichrist, the coming lawless one, is going to do in the temple. He says, displaying himself as being God. So he's going to be different than any other leader in the sense that he is going to say, I am God. He's going to put himself above God. There's a lot of parallel passages that we've looked at that teach the same kind of thing. I've tried to say that this is one of the problems with the Islamic uh, identification of the Antichrist. A lot of people think the Antichrist will be a Muslim. I think Islam is going to play a big role in the end times, but I don't think the Antichrist can be Muslim because I can't see a Muslim putting himself above Allah. But this, this coming lawless one will do that. So this idea where you set yourself up in the temple and you proclaim yourself to be God, this is the original sin of Lucifer, and it's why Satan originally fell. And we have a description of that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. It's a description of what was running through Lucifer's mind before God deposed him from the heavenlies. Lucifer, of course, meaning light bearer. Uh, that's why the Bible says Satan comes as an angel of light. Um, Lucifer originally created, Ezekiel tells us, as a cherub, high-ranking cherub, but he became prideful on account of his beauty. So Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 describes what was going through his head. And these are the five I will statements. And these I will statements are a big deal because this is the first time a will entered the universe that was counter God's will. I mean, from eternity past up to this point in time, the only will that governed was God's. Now we have a creation, the angelic realm, and you have one of those angels asserting his will against God. And it's the fifth I will statement that the Antichrist is going to sound an awful lot like. So it says in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, how you have fallen from heaven, O star. Uh, angels are t often called stars in the Bible. O star, son of the morning, you have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I, <clears throat> those are your first I will statement, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, meaning the stars of God are the angels. I don't want to govern the angels for God. I want to govern the angels in place of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. Now, the mount of assembly is where Jesus is going to rule and reign one day in the millennium, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And what Lucifer is saying there is, I'm going to run the world in the millennium, not Jesus. And then verse 14, I will ascend 
above the heights of the clouds. The clouds in the scripture typically refers to God's glory. So he wanted the glory of God. And then he said, I will make myself like the Most High. Verse 15, nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So if you look at number four here, he's, uh, excuse me, number five, he's wanting to be godlike. I mean, that's sort of inferred in the others, but he's very blatant that he wants to be like God. Here's what Isaiah 14, 14 says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So it's that uh, self-deception that caused Lucifer to lose his position in the heavenly realms, and this is how he became uh, Satan. I think it was Billy Graham uh, who said, People in ministry always fall for one of three reasons, or sometimes it's a combination of all of the above. But he said, number one, to ministers, he says, don't touch the gold. These all begin with G, by the way. Don't touch the gold, financial scandal. Number two, don't touch the girls, (laughs) sexual immorality, that's what he was talking about. And then the third one, he said, is don't touch the glory. And so if you watch when people fall in ministry, it's typically, you'll see, you'll see oh, it's that G, oh, it's that G, oh, it's that G, oh, it's a combination of Gs. This is why 1 Timothy 3, I think it's verse 6, says, you know, don't lay hands too quickly. 1 Timothy 5.22, I think it is, don't lay hands too quickly. And you discover why earlier in the book, 1 Timothy 3, 6, about an elder. He must not be a recent convert, lest he fall into the trap of Lucifer or Satan. Paul, when he wrote that, I believe was referring to this passage in Isaiah 14 and also in Ezekiel 28, because those are the only two passages we have describing Satan's fall from heaven. So someone that's a new convert will see God working through him as an elder and he will think it's his education or his presence on the elder board that's causing all of these good things. And he won't have enough of a walk with the Lord yet to understand that it's God using him. He'll sort of get the big head and and think, gee, God, you sure are lucky to have me on your team, you know, kind of thing. As if uh, God can't use a rock. I mean, think about that sometime if God uses you, when he uses you, and you say, wow, I really did well on that. Well, he could use a rock, but he chose to use you instead. Probably be easier using a rock when you think about it. (laughs) The rock doesn't sit there and argue with you all day. And then also in the Old Testament, he used a donkey. So if he can use a rock and use a donkey, he could use you. Because the reason I say rock is Jesus was told to rebuke his disciples, and he said, well, if these are quiet, then the rocks will cry out. By the way, when you go to Israel, there's a lot of rocks there. So that would be a heck of a choir when you think about it. All those rocks in Israel kind of singing. So the problem with the new convert is they don't, understand these truths, they start to take credit for things that God is doing, and as Billy Graham said, don't touch the glory. So, when the Antichrist goes into the temple, Satan's man of the hour, we know he's Satan's man of the hour because of verse 9, which we haven't gotten to yet. It's not a big shock that he would espouse the very concept or the very lie that got his key influencer pushed out of heaven originally. And then you get to Genesis chapter 3, and that's the fall of man. This little chart here, um, or PowerPoint, lays out the, the, the... strategies that Satan used against Eve 
and then Adam to get them to fall. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, we are not unaware of Satan's schemes. So Satan has an intellect, he has schemes, he has strategies. Um, basketball analogy, you may have heard before, but when I was playing basketball, seventh grade all the way through my senior year in college, I mean, we would spend, um, before we faced any team, we would just spend uh, hours and hours and hours watching recordings of the other team playing. And, and when we did that, we would understand their strategies. Who are their key scorers? What kind of defense do they run? All these sorts of things. And so we stepped onto the court prepared, not unaware of the other team's strategies. Paul says that's how we're to be in the body of Christ. We are to not be caught unaware by Satan's schemes. Most Christians have never been exposed to enough of the Bible, unfortunately, to know what Satan's schemes are. But these are basically Satan's four schemes. He runs them over and over again. He doesn't have to be creative because he's not forced to because people just fall for these constantly. And these are all quotes from Genesis 3 and Genesis 2, but he adds to God's word, he challenges God's goodness, he subtracts from God's word. And then that fourth one there, he offers wisdom without submission to God. Because the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I was actually watching a, a senator trying to mock the Bible one time on the Senate floor. He says, you can't trust the Bible because it says there is no God. And I thought, I wish he would read the first part. It doesn't say there is no God. It says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the path to foolishness is denying God. But the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, verse 7, is the beginning of knowledge. The path to understanding is submission to God. When you reject God, you become a fool. You become, your mind becomes darkened. I would call them Romans 1 fools, where the intellect becomes darkened because they've suppressed a true knowledge of God. <clears throat> but the path to understanding is submission to God. So Satan here is telling Eve that you can gain wisdom without submitting to God. You can break the formula. That's why he in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 said, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this is a strategy that Satan ran to get our forebears to fall into sin. Convince them they, can be, they don't need God. You can be wise without God. You can be knowledgeable without God. It's the same lie that Lucifer deceived himself with. Isaiah 14, verse 14. So when Satan's man of the hour steps into the temple displaying himself as being God, that's not a big shock because that's exactly what we read in Genesis 3 and it's exactly what we read in Isaiah 14. So any belief system that tells you you can be God, you can automatically detect that it's not coming from the right source. Mormons think that they can become gods and have their own planet one day. Uh, the New Age Movement, Shirley MacLaine, remember her book, Out on a Limb, I think it was also a movie. That famous scene where her arms are outstretched standing there on Malibu Beach, about an hour from where I grew up, saying over and over again, I am God. I am God. I mean, you can imagine what God himself thought about that, looking at this little speck down there. What is she saying? She's saying over and over again, I am God. I am God. She, that's what New Age believes. You evolve into deity. 
And if you don't do it right in this life, you just get recycled in the next life and you get another opportunity. But it's all this idea that you can become God without the real God, without any relationship to God. Even uh, some of the things you see on so-called Christian television, the prosperity movement, uh, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it as I call it, where you can create your own reality. Uh, they, they teach that you're a, a son of the king or a kid of the king, so you shouldn't go through life with a body with any physical ailments in it whatsoever. And so you just need to command those elements right out of your body that are causing problems. You don't humbly go to God in petition and prayer saying, Lord, if it's your will, I'm praying for healing. You don't do that. It's the healing's already yours. They, you know, they tell us. You just, you just have to access these verbal laws and command those physical ailments out of your body. And by the, by the way, you can do the same thing with your bank account or a house or whatever it is you want. You just command it into existence. You speak your own reality. It's not the way Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, not my will be done, but thy will be done. You command things into existence. And when you actually look at why they're teaching this, it's the, what's called the little God's doctrine. Um, Kenneth Copeland and these types of people have been teaching this for, for decades. And, it, and it, you know, people really focus on the prosperity side of it as problematic, but really the part of it that you need to focus on is the little God's element of it where they think they have this right. There's a really good book that was written about this in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the title of it is Agony of Deceit. And it does a really good job explaining how the prosperity gospel is linked to uh, I am a God type of doctrine. So it's just kind of the same old thing, you know, recycled over and over again. And so I think when the Antichrist goes into the temple and deifies himself, people are going to kind of say, oh, well, that's cool. No big deal. Not blasphemous. We've, we've been taught already in our culture that we can become God. So now in American society, the dominant religion that is being taught in the public schools is humanism. And it's been that way ever since 1963. 1963 is when the Supreme Court, an unelected Supreme Court, took all the Bible reading and prayer, later the Ten Commandments, and completely stripped them from the public square, including the schools. And they did it under the myth that we have to make the public schools neutral. The truth of the matter is, though, when they did that, because nature abhors a vacuum, the schools didn't become neutral. They simply exchanged one religion for another. They exchanged Christianity, which our country was founded upon. The Supreme Court said that in the case of the United States, I think it is, versus the Church of the Holy Trinity, 1892 where a pastor was being brought across the pond to pastor a church, I think in New York. And at that time, our country said, you can't do that because of immigration laws. So I guess there was a time in our history when we cared about immigration laws. We don't seem to really care that much about them lately. So they brought this pastor across the pond and he was gonna pastor this church at New York and they said, you can't do that because you're breaking the immigration laws. And the Supreme Court stepped in in 1892 and said, well, that can't be the right interpretation of the immigration laws because this is a Christian country. And nobody in their right mind would pass a law that would inhibit Christianity. And that was not one of these narrow, today we see these kind of five, four rulings. Uh, that was like a unanimous decision and they cited 
about 87 historical precedents, you know, primary sources, starting with things Christopher Columbus said about Christianity, uh, going from there to the Mayflower Compact, 1620, which was our first governing document in the United States that we're here for the advancement of the Christian religion, 1620, into the Ivy League institutions, and they, they start going through, 87, you ought to read it, you ought to just Google it. It's a short case, too. Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, 1892, and they get to the end of it, and uh, the, the gentleman that wrote the majority opinion, Justice David Josiah Brewer, said, you can't have a law that inhibits a pastor because we are a Christian country, Christian nation. So when people disparage this idea that America was founded on Christianity, well, it's the ruling of the United States Supreme Court. So in no way, shape, or form did our founding fathers ever intend to push Bible reading and prayer out of the public schools, but that's what the Supreme Court did later in time, 1962 to 1963, and when that happened, the religions of the United States just changed places. Humanism became the dominant religion, and Christianity was pushed off to the side. So what is humanism? And when you look at humanism, that's why I've entitled this Bible study, Humanism on Display because that's what the Antichrist is promoting in the temple. If you look at it very carefully, verse four, displaying himself as being God. When that happens, people are gonna say, well, that, that's all right, that's what we've been taught for generations because of humanism. In other words, the culture of the day is preparing the way to desensitizing the public to what the Antichrist is gonna do in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. So what is humanism? There's three books written on humanism. One is in 1933. The second one is in 1973. And the third one is called Humanism 2000 to coincide with, you know, Y2K and all of that stuff. The 73 document, I think I mentioned this before, was signed by a lot of famous people. Uh, one of them is named Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer. Another one it, it was named Lester Mondale. Does the name Mondale ring a bell? He was the vice president under Jimmy Carter, and then I think from Minnesota, he ran again to be senator there, but lost to a guy, I think, named Norm Coleman, if, if memory is right, from, from Minnesota. But you have all of these kind of movers and shakers signing onto this document. And this is what they teach around the clock. And the deception of it is people think it's neutrality. But there is no such thing as neutrality. You're teaching something from someone's angle. So the inculcation of subsequent generations comes from the framework of humanism. So when you read these three documents, and I would encourage you to read them, they're somewhat short. They read like doctrinal statements in a church. Like if you wanted to know where Sugarland Bible Church stands on, on different doctrinal things, you would just read our doctrinal statement. Well, the humanists have done the same thing. They put their doctrines together in these three books. 1933 was the first one, 1973 was the update, and then the latest one is the year 2000 document. But essentially, here's what they believe. They believe in the non-existence or irrelevancy of God. They don't want any God talk. In fact, God, if he exists, and they, they're kind of open to his existence, you know, maybe he's hiding somewhere in the universe, maybe he's out there, I don't know. But if he does exist, he doesn't have any relevance to our lives. Well, then who's the most relevant thing? Second bullet point, man is the center of all things. You gotta have a God, right? And if you reject the true God, you just make yourself God. So that's why it's called humanism. Well, then where do we come from? Well, of course, evolution is where we came from. 
Don't, don't question the science on that one. That's a fact in their minds. The fourth bullet point, man is an evolved animal rather than a special creature made in his image or in the image of his creator. So people, basically what they are, are na basically naked apes. If you want to visit your ancestors, go visit the orangutans in the county zoo sort of mi mindset. And it's kind of funny to uh, listen to these pundits, you know, complain about violence in society because now our cities are more violent than they once were, et cetera. And one guy said, you know, people are acting just like animals. And I'm like, well, how do you expect them to act when you teach them that they're just evolved animals? And if you teach someone you're an evolved animal, that's how you're going to act. The second to last bullet point is there is an absence of any absolute morals or values. So they want to get away from 10 commandments, thus saith the Lord, some kind of transcendent morality, this is right, this is wrong. It's sort of um, what the group thinks, you know, would be appropriate is what morals become. So they put these kids through these drills. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly, a few decades ago, write up, wrote a book called Child Abuse in the Classroom, where she was talking about these sorts of um, academic drills that they put these kids through, like you're in a, you're in a boat and um, there's only enough food for you know, five people and you got six people in the boat, and so who are you gonna throw overboard? And so you kind of have to adjust morals depending on the situation. That's basically called situational ethics. Ethics are determined by the situation. So you look at what's going on in the Middle East and they would say, you know, Hamas is just a freedom fighter, just like those that founded the United States of America. So they take these apples and oranges comparisons and they kind of jam them together and so people, and they're sitting under this indoctrination constantly. I can't remember the number of hours you spend in their system, but once you get into the system, the amount of time that you spend under the system compared to the time you're spending with your own parents and your own nuclear family is, uh, is, is dominant. So by the, by, the, by, the, by the time it's all said and done, the system has more influence of, of you than your own family does. I'm not here to put, I mean, I know there's some godly people in the public schools and, and all of those kinds of things. I'm not um, condemning them. Uh, what I'm saying is you're stuck in a system that you're not in control of. And that they have absolute uh, confidence, the last bullet point down there, in the scientific method to solve the world's problems. So that's basically what humanism is. If you believe the Bible, and this is why they don't like the Bible, and in particular, they don't like the first 11 chapters of the Bible, because that's the foundation upon which Christianity rests. You should destroy those early chapters of the Bible, you don't have a Bible anymore. But the very first word in the Bible blows away humanism. Very first verse, I should say. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's the greatest miracle God did. He spoke, ex nihilo we call it, something out of nothing and the heavens and the earth leaped into existence. And man wasn't even on the scene yet. Man doesn't come into existence until day six. So what your Bible says is God did the greatest, his greatest miracle that he's ever done to, to our knowledge before man was even around. Man was not even there as a consultant. So obviously, 
man is the center of all things, second bullet point there, which is what humanists teach, cannot be true because God did His greatest miracle before man ever existed. In fact, Genesis 1 verse 1, if you believe what it says, it destroys every anti-God philosophy that's out there. It destroys atheism because it says God created. It destroys pantheism, the worship of the earth, because God is transcended over creation. It destroys polytheism, many gods, because it says God created. It destroys materialism, the worship of matter, because matter had an origin. It destroys dualism, that God has a rival in the universe somewhere, kind of like, you know, uh, Rocky and Apollo fighting. Uh, We don't know who's going to win here. Is God going to win or is Satan going to win? No, this is no contest because God alone created. God spoke and everything came into existence, including the angelic realm. The very bottom, it destroys naturalism. Naturalism is just another way of saying evolution. We all came from some naturalistic process because Genesis 1.1 says God created. And it destroys humanism, the one I have underlined there, because it says God rather than man created. If God rather than man created, then man cannot be the center of all things. When you take a look at a worldview, basically what a worldview is, is it's a set of eyeglasses that allows you to evaluate everything around you. That's what the Bible is to the Christian. Because the Bible speaks to every issue of life. Finances, you'll find it in the Bible. Economics, you'll find it in the Bible. Families, what's a family? You'll find it in the Bible. Uh, Politics, government, what what is that all about? You'll find a description of it in the Bible. Mental health, emotions, you'll find a description of it in the Bible. The Bible speaks to every issue of life. So, as you're in the Bible, what God is doing is He's putting over your eyes, not neutrality, but a set of eyeglasses by which you can look at anything in the world and evaluate it by by an objective standard. Everyone has a worldview, every single person. Even those that don't think they have a worldview have a worldview. The atheist has a worldview. The communist has a worldview. The Nazis have a worldview. The humanist has a worldview. It's just in the process of progressive sanctification, God says through His Word, I want to be your worldview. So Christianity is going to answer the most fundamental questions of life. Who am I? No more fundamental question than that, right? Well, you're a special creation of God. That's why we treat each other respectfully, even those that are outside the faith because they bear God's image. Hamas wasn't doing that, were they, October 7th? Because they've got a different worldview. Their worldview is Jews are the descendants of apes and pigs. It's in the Quran, by the way, that statement. So the violence that happened October 7th, decapitation of babies, all these horrible things that we read about. By the way, what happened to Israel is equivalent of our 9-11 if you look at it on a per capita basis. I mean, Hamas coming from Gaza was just acting consistently according to their worldview. We did a podcast on this this week, by the way, Pastor's Point of View with Dr. Randall Price. Uh, Part one is up. Part two is coming uh, next week. But he just did a wonderful job explaining this, if you're interested. Uh, You can go to my YouTube channel to find it. if you're interested, who am I, a special creation of God? Where did I come from? Well, I came from God's design. I'm not an accident. 
We tell that to our daughter all the time. Probably every single day we say to her, you're here because God put you here. You're, you're here, you're special in the sense that the fact that you're even here is miraculous. And because you're here and God put you here, God has a special purpose for your life. Now, if, if she was um, under evolutionary teaching constantly, she would think, well, I'm here just as some kind of freak of nature. I'm a total accident. And she, that's how she would live her life. But you live your life differently when you understand the Christian worldview that you're here from God's design. Who am I, special creation of God, made in His image? Where did I come from, the, the design of God? Where, why am I here? Well, I'm here to glorify God. That's why I'm here. So everything I do is about His glory. That's my purpose. And to the extent that I press into that purpose is the extent to which I'll be fulfilled in life. If you're living outside of your design, you can't be fulfilled. If you're living for self, humanism, you can't be fulfilled because you were put here to glorify God. Where am I going? We're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. Better sooner than later. Amen? How can I get there? Only through Jesus Christ. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, humanists teach, answer these exact same worldview questions with a different answer. I'm just trying to demonstrate how humanism is just as much a comprehensive worldview as is Christianity. Who am I? Humanist says, you're a biological accident. Where did I come from? Humanist answer from the primordial soup. Man crimed out of the primordial soup, we're told 4.5 billion years ago, something to that effect. Why am I here? To fulfill self. Well, why would a humanist say you're here to fulfill self? Because it goes back to one of their bullet points here, man is the center of all things. If man is the center of all things and God, if he exists at all, is irrelevant, then obviously I'm not here for God. I'm here for myself. Where am I going? Towards a planetary new order, new world order. That's their language. And you read through these books and they describe, it's, it's really fascinating, that humanity is progressing into a one world government where nations would sort of be absorbed into some kind of transnational transcendent govern, government that governs the nations. That's, where, that's what they want. Well, that explains the huge push in our society towards the new world order. Politicians saying one thing to the people and getting, in off, getting into office, and suddenly you start to see, well, they're, they're serving the globe, not America. So then there's this reaction against it you know, make America great again. I mean, why, why is this tension happening in our culture right now? Because of an ambition amongst many people, spearheaded by humanists, to push us into global governance. Now, if you're a bi Bible reader, you say, well, we tried global governance before. It didn't work so well. It's called the Tower of Babel. And the Antichrist is going to have his shot at global governance, and it's not going to end so well either. So I don't, I don't really want global governance. I would like for the people in Washington to represent me, not the globe. And they say, well, I know I told you that to get elected, but I'm following a humanist blueprint, by the way. So just, just go back to your life. Be busy. Oh, and if you're not busy enough, here's a bunch of inflation. So you can't keep up financially anymore. You're struggling to make ends meet, and you won't pay attention to what I'm doing. It's all, it's all in these books. Where am I going towards a new planetary order? How can I get there? The scientific method. 
And it's, it's really laughable because these people, they don't apply the scientific method when it comes to creation. Because the scientific method says for something to be scientific, it has to be knowable, testable, observable, repeatable. Like the law of gravity, objects fall at 32 feet per second. You ready? Well, I don't want to do that because I'll wreck my phone. That's a scientific fact because I can drop this phone over and over again and I can establish there's a scientific law in effect that says objects fall at 32 feet per second. It's testable. When you're trying to tell me what happened billions of years ago as evolution dogma propagates that no one was there to see, you're not following the scientific method. So that's how to recognize problems in these worldviews that they're not right because sometimes you'll see internal inconsistencies in them. And what's interesting about humanists is they call themselves a religion. There's, there's um, some of the page numbers in Humanist Manifesto 1 and Humanist Manifesto 2 where they actually say we are religious. They call themselves an advancement of religion. You see, see what I mean when I said the Supreme Court changed religions, exchange religions? Most people would think this is secular, but it's actually religious because it answers all of the religious worldview questions. It's a comprehensive worldview. And humanists in their own writings call themselves religious. Let's see, I think I lost my screen back there, if someone can help me with that. Uh, the advancement of a religion, they call themselves. Religious humanists. Religious humanism. You guys can still see up here, right? Okay, that's, that's more important. That's why, if you go back to the 1970s, Jimmy Carter was the president, and Ronald Reagan was running. This would be about 1980. And Ronald Reagan had sort of befriended Jerry Falwell and so there was this uh, kind of insurgence of Christians coming back into political life, which I think is healthy because it restrains evil. And they, the candidates got into this debate about who was the most Christian because Jimmy Carter claimed to be a Christian, you know, born again Jimmy, right? Ronald Reagan claimed to be a Christian, and somehow it came out which one of these guys is the most Christian. And I remember Jimmy Carter kind of defending himself, saying, well, I'm, I'm very Christian, I'm very religious, and so is my vice president, Walter Mondale. He's extremely religious. Now, there's no doubt Walter Mondale, whose brother, Lester Mondale, signed the Humanist Manifesto, was religious. It's just what they weren't telling the public is it was the religion of humanism. The Supreme Court in 1961 even recognized secular humanism as a religion. It says, among the religions in this country which do not, uh, this is uh, in a footnote in the case, among the religions in this country which do not teach what would generally be considered a belief in the existence of God are Buddhism, Taoism, ethical culture, and there it is, secular humanism and others. So the Supreme Court actually said in 1961, secular humanism is a religion. And yet they get to teach their religion around the clock in the public schools, whereas we as Christians have been pushed out. It's, it's an exchange of religions is what's happened. This is a quote, I saw it quoted somewhere and I, th I thought this quote couldn't be true. So I spent all afternoon one time going through the different libraries in Houston trying to track this down. This is a quote by Charles Francis Potter. He made this quote in 1930. And look at the title of his book. Well, you can't look at the title of his book because it's in, it's real small at the bottom. 
So unless you've been drinking your carrot juice in the morning, you can't see it. But the, the title of his book is Humanism, A New Religion. So this gentleman, Charles Francis Potter, was one of the leaders of the advent of humanism in the United States of America, and the very title of his book is Humanism, A New Religion. So they're calling themselves a religion. Well, how are you going to propagate your religion, Mr. Potter? This is a Christian country. He says, oh, that's easy. We're going to take over the public schools. And then we're going to use the public schools to around the clock in a compulsory education, uh, a compulsory manner, educate subsequent generations, and we'll shift the values of this whole culture away from Christianity into humanism. So he telegraphed, remember what Paul said concerning Satan? We're not unaware of his schemes. This is a satanic scheme that I'm talking about here. Potter says, quote, education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. Education we, is our friend. We just want to use it for our purposes. Continuing with the quote, and every public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only the, a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching, close quote. Hey, you guys can have your Sunday schools. You can have VBS one week during the summer. Most, that's how most churches operate. We just want the schools. We want the teachers' colleges, and we want the schools, because if you give us those, we've got the youth around the clock. We can even assign homework. I mean, we can, we can keep them working on so much busy work that they won't have any time for church anymore, or mom and dad, and this has been in place, what he said in 1930, since 1960, and we're kind of looking at our churches saying, where did, where did all the young people go? What happened to them? Or read the, read the, go back and watch the video before the game. Who, you're, who are you playing here? What's the playbook? What's the blueprint? They told us what they were going to do. Here's another quote. This is a later quote. This is from the early 80s. It's by a man named uh, John Dunphy writing for a magazine called The Humanist. He says, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future, what's humankind's future? Global governance, don't you understand? We got to get away from the nation state. That's the only way to solve the world's problems. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won where? In, in the street, in the alley. Uh, through armies? No, he says it must be waged and won in the public school classrooms. We just have to change the thinking of people. By teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith. Ah, he's evangelistic. He's religious. He wants a pulpit. The quote continues, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call, now I don't know what theologians he's quoting here. I don't think the same ones I quote, by the way. Respects the spark of what theologians call the divinity where? God, transcendent, no. Divinity where? In every human being. Isn't that what humanism teaches? Man is the center of all things. He goes on and he says, these teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, close quote. We need some fundamentalist preachers, kind of like what you guys listen to at Sugarland Bible Church, some, some zealots. But we need them in the public schools teaching our religion. 
can I, excuse me, uh, Mr. Dunphy, Mr. Potter, United States Supreme Court, well, can I have equal time and go into the public schools and teach my religion, which is, by the way, what America was founded on? No, nope, no, you can't do that because of the strict wall of separation between church and state. Well, excuse me, why can they teach their religion, but I can't teach, teach my religion? Oh, they're really not teaching a religion. They're after science. Trust the science. Whereas when you look at all of their writings, they claim to be very religious. This guy's calling for rabid fundamentalist preachers. Kind of sounds religious to me. They're writing in magazines called The Humanist and in their own writings calling themselves a religion. So here comes the Antichrist. He goes into the temple and he deifies not God, but himself. And the world at that time says, well, that's awesome. That's not abnormal at all. That's actually cool because this is the type of religious training I've received because after all, we are all gods anyway. So Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says, look, you're not in the day of the Lord because number one, the departure hasn't happened first. Number two, you haven't seen the Antichrist desecrating the temple. And then the third thing you haven't seen is you haven't seen the removal of the restrainer. Look at verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? This is a review class. This is why some of the things that Paul says concerning the departure is different than terminology that he used to describe the rapture earlier. This is why a lot of people don't think the apostasia is the rapture in verse 3. Because they say if Paul had wanted to describe the rapture, he would have used the word harpazo, which he uses in the first book, 1 Thessalonians. So therefore, this couldn't be the rapture. Well, it could be the rapture if you understand that he's just reviewing material at this point. When you review for the test at the end of the semester, you don't reteach the class. I mean, I've, I've been a teacher at a school for a long time, currently with Chafer Theological Seminary, before that with the College of Biblical Studies here in Houston. I gave a lot of exams, reviewed for the exam at the end of the semester. When you review for the exam at the end of the semester, you don't reteach the material all over again. Now, sometimes you feel like you need to, but you're not supposed to. You actually use different words when you review because you're summarizing what was said rather than restating the same stuff over and over again. That's why he does not use the word harpazo in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to describe the rapture. He uses a different word. And why can't Paul do that? Because he uses multiple words to describe the rapture. See, a lot of people are just going to skip right over verse 5. Don't you remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things, and yet that verse is the key to unlocking so much of the vocabulary that Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians. And one other quick thing on verse 5. I want you to understand something. These are baby Christians. Paul had planted the church in Thessalonica. He was there six months to a year. He was kicked out. He went down uh, south to Corinth. And within six months to a year, he's answering the questions that they had already had about Bible prophecy. Indicating that when these people got saved, and they hadn't been saved for very long, they had come out of paganism. He had taught them the full range of doctrine, including prophecy. 
Now, I bring that up because a lot of people will say, you never teach a new believer about Bible prophecy. You teach them the important stuff first. The Trinity, virgin birth, inerrancy of the Bible. And then when they reach a certain age, then you can teach them about prophecy. In fact, when I got saved in 1983, I had a lot of questions about prophecy. It was an area that was immediately of interest to me, and unfortunately some, not all, of my early disciplers basically told me to not worry about that stuff. Yeah, but what about the rapture? There's pre and mid and post, and they said, well, pray for pre, but plan for post, is what they told me, which is no answer, right? And there's this mindset with young Christians, and you say, you're a new Christian, don't worry about prophecy. This verse here, 2 Thessalonians 2, 5, disproves that because he's laying out heavy truth concerning prophecy to brand new Christians as a review. And he's saying, don't you remember when I was with you, I was telling you this stuff all the time. You can't ignore prophecy because 27% of the Scripture was prophetic at the time it was written. So if you leave prophecy out of your diet or preaching or teaching ministry, you're leaving over a quarter of the Bible and you're putting it aside. 2 Peter 1 verse 19 says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention. You better pay attention to the prophetic word, Peter says. Why? Because it's a lamp shining in a dark place. Would you say our world's in a dark place? I have to be honest with you. This world is getting so dark, the only thing that keeps me sane is prophecy. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It's more sure than eyewitness testimony. It gives us light in a hopeless age, and it reminds us of the soon advent of the morning star, Jesus Christ. By the way, have you ever studied the morning star? The morning star is the star that breaks in terms of visibility when the night is its darkest. So when it's extremely, extremely dark, pitch black, the darkest it's going to get, look for the morning star. And that's how the coming of Jesus is analogized to this this morning star, this bright light that breaks forth in pitch darkness. That's why the late Adrian Rogers said of this world, it's growing gloriously dark because the stage is being set for the what? the morning star. It's just a different way of looking at the direction of our our world. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word, grateful for your truth, grateful for Paul and his writings to us in 2 Thessalonians. Help us to be good stewards of these things this week, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.